Okay, thanks for coming to the talk. I appreciate it. I had to go get my glasses. I'm sorry. I um, uh, just want to say uh, thanks so much to my longtime collaborator, Sung Hyung, who can't be here today. But all this research is done with him, so I wanted to put his picture up here just to recognize that we do all this together. Uh, what I'd like to do is today is talk about uh, getting bullying and all kind of maladaptive functioning out of the classroom. Um, and uh, to do that... A second. Uh, let me go back one. Thanks. This way. Yeah, you're right. Thanks. No, wrong way. Okay, uh, I just wanted to frame this. Uh, the, the concepts, the motivation, the SDT concepts that we found most useful, most helpful, most uh, informative are these three. Uh, teachers motivating styles, uh, intrinsic motivation or psychological needs, and internalization. And how we link these together in our research is we start with motivating style. Uh, we do a lot of work with the teachers. And what we try to do in our intervention research is work hard with teachers to teach them two essential skills. And the first one is develop the skill that they need in the classroom to promote intrinsic motivation, to have classes become more interesting. The second skill that we uh, emphasize is how to make learning activities worthwhile, personally useful to the students. So these are, this is how we integrate these three concepts. Uh, motivating style and the two skills of promoting, making learning activities interesting and um, important or personally useful to the students. Let me see if I can my slides here. I can't see this with the glasses. Okay, I forget that. Uh, so um, a quick story to set this up. A month ago, maybe a month and a half ago, Hyung Shim Jong and I went off to, we were invited to a uh, university in Korea in Incheon, if you're Korean, you maybe know what university that is. But we were invited to give this workshop to university uh, faculty on their motivating styles. And just a quick story, the, it was a two-part workshop. The first part went really well. Uh, this was mainly Hyung Shim doing this talk. But basically, how to, how to take any activity and make it significantly more interesting. How to make it need satisfying. How to infuse it with an experience of autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And she also does curiosity as well. Uh, this, this part of the talk went really well. Uh, student, the teachers, the professors, felt like they really picked up some helpful instructional strategies, understood students' motivation better, could solve some classroom problems, et cetera. And then part two, it was on uh, internalization. And this part of the talk uh, did not go well. Uh, uh, at least I didn't think so. What happened? Here's what I was suggesting that the teachers or the instructors do. First, take your students, if you're trying to promote internalization, uh, a, a willingness, uh, a volition to revise your paper, to participate in class discussion, et cetera. And what I was recommending, first take your student's perspective, imagine you're a student in the class, would this be personally useful to you? What kind of rationale could you provide? And then you can see an example of use respectful language as one thing you're trying to promote the students to internalize. And you do all the right things. Uh, you provide an explanatory rationale, acknowledge negative feelings, use invitational language. You can see the examples. But it, it didn't go well at all because I could see the faces turn and everything. And they said, uh, no, 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 you've got it wrong. The students should take my perspective. I shouldn't be taking their perspective. And basically the problem was my students are behaving in an irresponsible way and they should shape up and behave in a responsible way. That's, that's the essential uh, problem. I think, I think teachers face this all the time. I faced it, the teachers in the classrooms face it. So I wanted to talk about this and how we make, might make some progress on solving this, I think, difficult issue. So here's the problem statement. I was doing what teachers ask students to do a lot, to do what, something that they didn't really want to do. Take the student's perspective was really a roadblock in this uh, workshop. 
I was asking them to engage in something that they weren't interested in engaging in, that they didn't really value. They, they, they counter-argued against it. I, I felt like in my, my tone and my, my answers and my dialogue, I felt like I was slipping into something that felt more like persuading than supporting. So I knew that I was going in the wrong direction. And sorry about the strong words, but I blame Richard Ryan for it. Um, I was asking teachers to enslave themselves, to engage in a non-valued, uninteresting task, thereby sacrificing or losing or forfeiting or setting aside their autonomy to do what's right. Okay, these are serious side effects. I think they're very serious side effects. Uh, feeling enslaved to do what you don't really want to do and putting your autonomy aside for some other purpose. Uh, even though I was uh, up there taking their perspective, et cetera. Okay, I, if, to me, it felt more like social. I was trying to socialize these teachers, or they thought that, or some, we both thought it, rather than facilitate internalization. So what I, I, I would like to talk about today, I feel like uh, I or we, meaning everybody in this room, the collective we, need to come up with better how-to recommendations for teachers in the classroom of how to promote internalization. And these are, when you talk to classroom teachers, K-12 teachers, these are the big problems that they, they wrestle with. How to change disengagement to engagement, antisocial into pro-social behavior, underperformance, poor performance into uh, improved performance. So what we need is somehow this transition to happen, this uh, behavior change from maladaptive to adaptive, and we need the autonomy to come along with it. So our two criteria, you can also blame Richard Ryan for this, uh, whether internalization occurs, is does the person take in and accept as their own the, rec the teacher recommendation, uh, improve your scores or uh, learn the French or whatever it is. But we also want a high sense of autonomy satisfaction during the behavior request. And by satisfaction, personal endorsement's fine. I like satisfaction a little bit better because the student has a sense of, uh, yes, I want to do this, this is good for me, uh, I, uh, et cetera. I feel a sense of satisfaction, it, it's, it's right, it's right. So this is what happens, uh, motivationally speaking, when we ask people to engage in uninteresting, non-valued tasks from their point of view. Uh, we ask them to engage in an uninteresting task. So we set them up for a low autonomy satisfaction. And then if we push them a little bit uh, into compliance, we frustrate their autonomy. And also we deteriorate the relationship, the teacher-student relationship. As I push a little harder, though these should, this is really important, uh, you should uh, uh, revise your paper or something like this, then uh, the support can, from the student's point of view, slip into something that looks like conflict. So how do we uh, get bullying and all this other junk out of the classroom? Uh, theoretically, we start with a dual process model. Um, basically, to, if you want to promote adaptive functioning, uh, pro-social behavior engagement, then you really focus on autonomy support and autonomy satisfaction. If you want to get uh, bullying and stuff like that out of the classroom, you focus on need frustration and teacher control. So what we're gonna to try to do is diminish teacher control and need frustration in order to get bullying out of the classroom. So we, we, when we conduct our workshops, uh, we, we, there's, these are, take eight hours. We work very closely with teachers. We prepare like crazy. We try to give them a, a, a very rich experience. But this is my two minute version of what we emphasize in our workshops to promote autonomy for students. So imagine going, condensing eight hours into two minutes. So, um, first, to promote need satisfaction. We recommend that first work really hard before you go into the class, taking the student's perspective, and, and then uh, engaging in teacher talk like starting off the class, what would you like to do? Uh, I won't go through them all, but uh, uh, we're learning about uh, the Netherlands. Uh, what's the most interesting thing about the Netherlands? Where would you like to start? Uh, and, and et cetera. I really like asking the students for any suggestions. And it's very important, I don't think I have a pointer, but it's very important to also the, the small type. Once you ask students what they would like to do, to uh, go out of your way to support their initiative, their request, their uh, expression of interest. So okay, we'll go that way, we'll direct that way. And then on the right side, to diminish frustration, it's a little bit more familiar. We're trying to take controlling instructional behaviors and transform them into autonomy supportive instructional behaviors. So you take uninteresting activities and rethink the activity, how you present it, make it interesting. Uh, directives into rationales. 
uh, complaining into acknowledging, accepting negative affect, pressure into invitation. Okay, so uh, let me go through five of our studies. I'm just gonna give you the results uh, for the sake of time. What we do in our interventions uh, is just the, the left and the medium part of the figure. We just try to work with teachers to upgrade their motivating style so they'll be more capable of increasing students' need satisfaction and diminishing teachers' need frustration. We feel like that's our job, that's our responsibility, that's why we're there, just to produce these two effects. Now what I'll show you in all these five slides, everything to the right of that, that's up to self-determination theory to take it. If you, uh, self -de if you experience greater need satisfaction, lesser need frustration, then it's up to SDT to take care of the rest, to link it to antisocial behavior, engagement, et cetera. So in our first study, sure enough, uh, en engagement goes up and down as need satisfaction goes up and down. Uh, disengagement goes up and down as need frustration goes up and down. So we got a little confident that uh, we could explain, we could help teachers increase engagement. Then in this study, it was with PE teachers. If you talk to PE teachers, one of their, their fiercest complaints is a motivation. Students come to class, they don't think PE is important, they sit on the sidelines, they don't do anything, they just literally sit there the whole class. So a motivation is a real problem, so well, we'll help you with that. So here we go again. If we, well, if we can increase the need satisfaction, we can increase the engagement. If we can decrease the need frustration, we decrease the A motivation. Continuing on, then we got a little bit more confident. So how about we, we tackle uh, fighting and verbal abuse and antisocial behavior? What about that? Well, uh, need frustration to explain that. So you can see we keep going with these studies, uh, letting self-determination theory predict everything on the right side, which it's able to do. In a fourth study, these are all uh, longitudinal experimental studies, and we manipulate motivating style in that box. In this study, our first big surprise was uh, what our intervention was doing. We, this is antisocial behavior. We think this is a, a very social behavior. Uh, people are rude to me. I see everybody else uh, dissing everybody else. It seems to catch on in a social way as much as a personal way. So what we found in this study, that the, the, the manipulated motivating style was producing two effects, not just one. It was affecting need satisfaction, need frustration. Uh, the, the first, the lower green and the upper red. But it also had this effect on peer-to-peer -peer relationships. If the teacher would change her motivating style, the students changed how they interacted with each other, even when the teacher wasn't present. The relationships became more supportive and less conflictual. The, the peer climate, the, the, the social context had changed because the teacher had changed her motivating style. And one more study, and we took on what we thought was the toughest problem of all was bullying. And we found that um, manipulated motivating style did explain uh, getting bullying out of the classroom. Uh, only the kicker was bullying is so social. Bull the reason people bully is kind of interesting. I see everybody else bullying. I was bullied myself. Uh, you get into this culture of bullying. And if the culture doesn't exist, you're, you probably never bully. So what really explained bully was a change in a bully climate, a bully culture in the classroom. And autonomy supportive teachers were able to get that bully culture out of the classroom. I can explain the details of that, but I'm watching the time. So two pre-conclusions, I've got two more conclusions after this. Uh, manipulated motivating style uh, did what it was supposed to do, diminish uh, maladaptive functioning and promote adaptive functioning. But it produced two effects. It affected uh, autonomy, need satisfaction, frustration, but it also affected peer-to-peer -peer relationships. So this was a surprise. We think this is partly explaining why we get such big effect size, why we're, uh, our, our effect size for disengagement, a motivation, antisocial behavior, always greater than one. So we're not only having this motivational effect, we're having this social effect. And we kept going, and it does a third thing, manipulated, motivating style. If you can work with a teacher and she becomes more autonomy supportive than before, her students also start this is actually a study with teachers, but we've done it with students. Um, they start to adopt intrinsic goals uh, during the class. And we went on with a fourth stu another study. 
Um, this needs explanation, but the, the, the only point I want to make today is manipulated, motivating style brought out student initiative, or we call it agency or agentic engagement. I'll talk about that here for a second. So manipulated, motivating styles doing many things. I think it's explaining why we get these big effect size. It's affecting need satisfaction, frustration, peer climate, student agency, and intrinsic goals that the students adopt. If I had a pointer, you could also see agency is kind of important. It, it longitudinally affects an increase in autonomy satisfaction, a decrease in autonomy dissatisfaction, a decrease in autonomy frustration. Okay, real quickly, what's engagement, agentic engagement, uh, initiative, asking questions, speaking up, offering suggestions, giving input into the instructions rather than just sitting there passively. Um, this is actually uh, Lina Matos' study. Um, what it shows in this study, real quickly, that if the teacher's more autonomy supportive, the students become more agentic. And if the student's agentic, the teacher becomes more autonomy supportive. Now why that's important is I, I, we think of autonomy support as giving autonomy support, and we think of agentic engagement as wanting autonomy support. I go into the classroom, I want more autonomy support. I want to uh, appeal to my interest, I want you to explain these things, et cetera. Uh, just to give you a feel for the relationship between autonomy support, which we think is so important, and agency, is you can see the first entry there. If I take the student's perspective, I become more aware of what they want and need. And if the students let me know what they want and need, I'm more likely to take their perspective. So you get this reciprocal uh, causation effect. Okay, uh, how does, this is the point of the talk. How does agency relate to internalization? First, agentic engagement, the student comes into class with their agency or the teacher inspires it, and it gives a voice to their uh, autonomy. The passive becomes actively active participant in the class, and the agentic student can recruit greater autonomy and support from the teacher. We're manipulating it, uh, the teachers are learning it, they're, they're developing the skills, and the students are bringing even more of it out of this. Now, if you want more information on agentic engagement, there's a symposium on Thursday, and this is the schedule. Um, but in this, uh, for the sake of time, I wanted to go on to the fourth, I think, catalyst for internalization. If you see over here on the far right uh, about intrinsic goals. So the students say things like, uh, the first two are um, personal growth. I want to develop skills. I want to grow in some way. Or relationship growth. I want to improve my relationships. I want to contribute to the welfare of the school or something like this. These are intrinsic goal pursuits. And... This is just asking uh, students for uh, an active type of internalization. What do I need to do to grow? I want to know. Even if it's a boring task, if it's a, a way to grow, uh, I'm willing to do it. Okay, now the two, two conclusions. Uh, when teachers come and participate in our interventions and we manipulate motivating style with an experimental group versus a control group, four things happen, we've learned. Not just what we, we thought back in... Ten years ago, one thing was happening, uh, the need satisfaction, need frustration. That's probably the most important. But we're also affecting the peer-to-peer -peer support. We're, we're now studying peer autonomy support, peer controlling. Um, fuels agency and encourages intrinsic goal pursuit in the class. Now, um, you can call them internalization supports. I like to think of them as internalization catalysts, where... Uh, Students come in, they really want authentically, actively, volitionally, want to go out and internalize the competent aspects of other people's function and bring it into the self. So it's a very volitional, active, intentional type of uh, internalization as opposed to the way rationales usually are. I'm trying to persuade you to do your homework. There's lots of good reasons you should do my homework. And it feels like persuasion rather than something I really want. So the implications... I think we need to stop asking students to do uninteresting, non-valued things, although we, all, all the time we do. Why not we fuel their agency and have them pursue intrinsic goals? It's, you're not going to like this, but I, 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 as I work more and more, I see the really central importance of autonomy support. I'm not a big fan anymore of structure. I'm a big fan of uh, uh, competent support, but not necessarily of structure. It feels like the culture's coming in and giving you recommendations rather than really autonomy support. 
And autonomy support has all these beneficial effects. I've, I mentioned four of them. And I would like you to be aware autonomy support comes in lots of forms. It doesn't just come from the teacher. Students can generate it from their own initiative. It comes from an interesting activity. It comes from your peers. It can really, once it catches on, like a wildfire in the class, you can get autonomy support from lots of different sources. And that's why you can get these large effect sizes. So uh, uh, one last slide, uh, one after this one, but uh, just my recommendations. Um, I wanted to put the picture of uh, Ed Deasy's uh, TED talk up there because uh, he asked, uh, uh, in an open-ended way at the end of his talk, how do we get all these wonderful things? And his answer, I remember with a shrug of the shoulders, is autonomy support. He doesn't say uh, autonomy support and structure. He's autonomy support, it can really carry the weight. Uh, so what I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting, we, we keep working with these teachers to promote their autonomy, and we ask them to look for these signals that they're really being autonomy supportive. Do you see signs of I want to instead of I have to as a proxy for a, a autonomy need satisfaction? How are the peers interacting? Are they supporting each other or is it conflictual and competitive? Do you see initiative? Are they speaking up? Are they expressing their preferences? Are they telling you what they want and need or are interested in? And are they pursuing uh, goals in an intrinsic goal rather than uh, some other way? So the last thing I'd like to uh, say is... Uh, this is last question. I'm not gonna answer it. I, I hope the talk has helped you to answer it, but it's wait, 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 hold on. What about those instructors I talked about at first? What, do I, what advice do I have to those instructors who just refuse to take the student's perspective? What about the student who's just deep in negative affect? I just don't wanna do the homework, no way, and runs out of the room and you can't make me. Um, what, about, what, what about, how do you handle that? if you're not gonna give rationales and uh, structure and things like this. Uh, I hope the talk is given, you can answer those questions. If not, I better go back and revise the talk. But it's a, it's a type of internalization that's active and volitional, student initiated. I'm gonna go out and become the person I want to become. Develop the habits, develop the skills, develop the, the knowledge that the culture has to offer. I'm going to take it in and become the person I want to become. It's a different way of thinking about internalization, I think. All right, thanks.